everyone and welcome to Energy Explored. This podcast covers the challenges of achieving a carbon neutral global economy, cutting emissions of gases and pollutants and setting up new energy systems. Join Reed Smith lawyers and guest speakers as they shed light on the most important trends in emissions control and new fuels. Tune in as we follow the ever evolving journey through the transition of energy. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Energy Explored. This is Peter Tremarkey. I'm a partner in the Reed Smith office in New York City. I'm joined by my partner, Todd Maiden, who comes to us from San Francisco. Hi, Todd. Good morning. How are you? Doing great today. I hope everyone out there in podcast world is doing well, too. We're here to provide just a brief follow-up on our earlier webinar from the energy transition we were talking about state incentives and state regulations that are coming down the pike and in fact in some many locations already existing that are implementing the energy transition now faster than are being done in the federal levels in both the United States and throughout the world. There are a lot of uh, very significant changes coming down the pike from these regulations and from these laws and we provided a brief summary of that. I talked quite a bit about the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act in New York, which is uh, was enacted in 2019 and is going to create some fundamental changes in the way we heat and light our buildings, the way we generate electricity, the way we move around the state, and caution everyone to be on high alert for the upcoming final scoping plan that's going to be coming from the Climate Action Council in December of 2022 that's going to lay out the basic framework that the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation is going to use to create regulations implementing Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. There's too much to go into here and repeat today, but um, quite a few changes coming down the road here in New York, so pay close attention to what's happening there. And then Todd spoke quite a bit about uh, what's going on in California, and I'll kick it over to him to remind or refresh your recollection if you were there or to whet your appetite for it if you missed it. Thanks, Pete. Yes, uh, so California is really a leader in the push towards carbon neutrality and energy usage in the state. So that's and talked about some of the different, the, the timeline and some of the interim deadlines. Renewables, of course, solar, wind type of alternative energy, a uh, big push for that. But we also talked about two two issues there. One, a lot of the uh, renewable projects are land intensive. Uh, the amount of space being taken up by wind turbine projects, solar, uh, large utility scale solar projects. Also, one of the big issues in California is a transmission hurdle. Uh, so even though you may have a renewable energy project, we have some very some severe limitations in our grid in terms of how we move energy around the state from where it can be produced to where it is needed. Offshore wind, we have a first time on the West Coast, our offshore auction of uh, ocean space. This is a federal auction, and we have two uh, lease areas, Northern California, Central California. Again, some transmission issues there. And just rounding it out, we talked about new legislation expanding or subsidizing use of hydro- clean hydrogen, green hydrogen, carbon sequestration, some new laws there that will lay that out, uh, direction as to how carbon sequestration or carbon capture and storage projects can be developed. And we also talked about lithium as a constituent of, of batteries and uh, recyclable batteries. And we, in the Salton Sea, Southern California, we have a huge geothermal formation there that may provide great opportunities to uh, develop lithium in the future, but it's just not up to scale yet. Great. Thanks, Todd. I think one of the things we wanted to accomplish on this call today, because we didn't have time to talk about it in our webinar, it was so chock full of content that we just couldn't get to this, to the more practical stuff, which is Now that we have let you know that these statutes are coming down the road, both in New York, California, but we also touched on things happening in Massachusetts, Washington, and Illinois, but we didn't get to talk about what businesses ought to be doing in response to these new statutes coming down the road. 
So we wanted to talk about a few of those things here today. And the first I'll pass over to Todd, which is figuring out whether or not these requirements are going to apply to your company by determining whether or not you have the types of emissions that are going to be covered. Thanks, Pete. So I, I think the, the issue there, or the, the big news, for particularly for publicly traded corporations, but also for uh, other companies that are doing business with publicly traded corporations, or that may have a, a, a relatively progressive ESG, environmental, social, and governance policy, uh, is going to assess what we what we call scope one, two, and possibly scope three emissions. What are those? Condensed very <laughs> dramatically is uh, scope one emissions are what's sort of coming out of your, your emission points, your smokestacks at your factory uh, would be the, the most easily uh, definable example of that. Scope two emissions, you may be running your facility on electricity. Well, what is the source of energy uh, for that electricity? Is your facility running on solar power, wind power, a coal-fired power plant, nuclear, something else? Those are your scope two emissions. All of these things are, are emissions that are either you're already tracking those because of regulatory permits or other other reasons, or it's relatively easy to figure that out on the scope two emissions. The scope three emissions are everything else. The carbon emissions that relate to upstream or downstream, in other words, outside of your facility in terms of bringing raw materials, developing them, transporting them to your facility, or once the those materials are, are used in a product or service, the downstream customer use of those, those are all your scope three emissions. This is a very controversial area. The Securities Exchange Commission is currently in the process of, of trying to implement regulations to require scope three emissions, at least from publicly traded corporations, the way those regulations are drafted, uh, it would require publicly traded corporations to estimate their scope three emissions from upstream sources, their vendors and suppliers, uh, and including downstream use. So if you are doing business with a publicly traded corporation, even if you are not publicly traded yourself, you may have some contractual obligations to work with that corporation to assess your carbon emissions, or, or if you, even if you're not contractually obligated, there may be a way for you to increase your market share by telling people, we can do this, we can assess these emissions, we can reduce them, and get customers that you wouldn't otherwise be able to do. But it's very controversial. A lot of people have lobbed in uh, objections or criticism of scope three emissions, and my view of this, this is my own observation, not necessarily that of Reed Smith or any of our other clients, but due to the midterm elections and likely changes in Congress, I think you're, you're going to find there's going to be some pushback on that, and the scope three emissions may not be rolled out as quickly as the Biden administration would like to see it happen. Second, the, the other issue there is a recent Supreme Court case called West Virginia versus EPA. And the holding in that case it actually dealt with other types of air pollution. But basically, the doctrine in that case was that in extraordinary cases of political and economic significance, where an, a federal agency makes an unheralded use of its authority, the agency must be able to point to a clear statement from Congress authorizing its action. So applied to this scenario, has U.S. Congress really given clear authority to the Securities Exchange Commission to regulate scope three emissions? That's going to be the issue. I think that there's going to be a lot of debate over whether that's been given. I think if you see a change in the makeup of Congress, there's going to be a lot of people in Congress making statements that they clearly are not authorizing the SEC to regulate scope three emissions. So th th that's an issue on assessment, but 
even if that were off the table, I think there's still a lot of reasons why progressive companies with very active environmental social governance policies are still wanting to become carbon neutral. They still may be going through this process and assessing scope one, two, three emissions. So you, if, if you're in business, you have to hedge for this and look at it as, is this going to become a regulatory requirement and anti just to get into and stay in the game? Or is this something where you could have a competitive advantage by jumping the queue and being able to perform these assessments, provide this information, and gain access to market share that you did not have otherwise? I agree with with all that, Todd. It seems like in just about every facet of our society, whether it's sports or business, people are looking very closely at data because we've got more data in more forms than we've ever had before. Um, So it makes a lot of sense in this environment for companies to be understanding the data behind their emissions and then using that information both to comply with the laws and to, as Todd said, figure out whether there's a way they can turn that to their advantage. Along those lines, another thing that uh, businesses can be doing in response to these uh, these new requirements is to just go ahead and assess the type of energy that you're using in your operations and whether there might be alternatives for that that might be able to provide you an opportunity to to change your carbon footprint if that's what your your business is and if that provides an advantage to your business, or in some instances create emission offsets that can be sold and can actually create a product for your businesses. So there's a number of different ways that businesses can take advantage of this information. And again, the idea is making a good analysis of your energy use at your facility and then looking at alternatives and what benefits those can provide. There are a number of different ways businesses can obtain energy from different sources, uh, although it really depends upon the energy intensity of your business. If you're running a steel mill, it might be a little bit more difficult than if you're running a, a, a series of warehouses or just owning commercial real estate. Uh, but between vir- virtual PPAs, distributed generation resources, on-site geothermal, there's just a, a number of different ways that you can start to play around with your energy mix and see what kind of benefit it provides you and if that helps you come into compliance more quickly with the laws that, are, that we're going to be seeing coming into effect here in the very near future. Another thing that we're advising our clients to focus on is paying attention to the regulations as they are coming out. I I mentioned at the top of this that the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act in New York requires a final scoping plan to be issued by the end of December. And that scoping plan is going to identify the areas and the types of changes that DEC is going to need to make uh, in the regulations that they need to issue by the end of 2024. Uh, So it's critically important for businesses in New York to read that scoping plan, understand what items are on the table that the state DEC is likely to target in those regulations, and be ready to move in in the time frame in which it's going to be required. So it's keeping abreast of these regulations and these changes as they come is going to be critical in order to allow businesses to be as nimble as they're going to need to be to comply with these changes. These are not insignificant changes in any way. We really are talking about changes in fuel type, uses of fuels for transportation. In New York, we're going to be eliminating natural gas as a source of heating and cooling for buildings. Uh, We're going to be changing land use patterns in the state. So if you're thinking about building on a large greenfield parcel, um, the local municipal statute might change out from under you as you're in the process of designing and planning your business. So understanding how these changes are going to work is going to be critical for businesses. And then they can create, once they understand what's going on in the atmosphere around them in the states where they're active, then they can create uh, an action plan for figuring out how to mitigate those risks that are coming or opportunities that come along with those statutes. And Todd's going to talk a bit about that. Thanks, Pete. Yeah, the uh, layering on, on top of what you were saying there, because of there's relative lack of federal agreement, uniformity, and standards on this, it has become a much more complex process for regulated entities because you're, you're if you're, particularly if you're operating in multiple states, and you can see Pete's in New York, I'm in California, there's a 
similarity in the general transition towards carbon neutral economies, but different some deadlines are going to occur at a, at a different pace. There are some going to be some opportunities in some states that had touched on the sub uh, California state subsidies for green hydrogen projects that may not occur in other states. So it, it won't necessarily be a one solution fits all environments or all jurisdictions uh, outcome. So I, I would repeat or emphasize what Pete was saying in terms of now more than maybe ever before in my practice, there is a, a really much higher requirement to uh, have kind of have your ear to the ground in terms of regulatory developments, tracking legislation, possibly getting involved in uh, trade associations or other lobbying efforts. Uh, we've written letters on behalf of uh, uh, clients on, on matters to have a seat at the table to be involved with this. There's a lot, you can view this as threats in terms of change of regulations, or you could view it as an opportunity. And if you are aware of it and planning for it, it becomes a, a business opportunity. If not, it probably becomes a business threat and, and a risk to you. The, I think the other thing to think about is in your transactional work, your sort of project management or project due diligence, uh, the development of projects, they may be the the scoping of power resources if you if you have a policy of renewables are you locating in a place where you have access to those kinds of renewable energy sources if you're involved with a merger and an acquisition we have typical environmental due diligence that we normally perform for clients but now added into it layered into it is there a synchronization between the merging entities or the acquired entity in terms of their ESG policies, their carbon footprint uh, that matches what your board of directors is looking for or planning for? Well, I think that's a, a good segue into the last topic we wanted to talk about is you know, tying all this back in to ESG principles and goals, as Todd mentioned earlier. As we discussed, you know, now kind of more than ever before, environmental principles, social and governance principles are high on the list of items that companies are adjusting to and, and implementing now uh, at all levels of their companies. And it's happening at all size businesses. As Todd mentioned earlier, this is getting a lot of headlines in the publicly traded space as a result of the pending SEC regulations. But we're seeing it on the deals that we do all the time, whether it's for a private equity company or a strategic acquirer. What things we're looking at in our due diligence more than ever is whether or not the company has net zero goals, whether or not they have environmental sustainability goals and where they stand and whether or not those goals and their whether they're meeting those goals is consistent with the acquiring company's goals and whether or whether there's work to do. So solid and comprehensive and well thought out environmental policy is really a much more of a fundamental business requirement now than we've seen before. There was a, a time when nobody thought about it at all. Then there was a time where people looked at it as simply a liability to be managed. Now it's being seen as uh, you know, something that is, could be a strategic advantage to companies but also something that people are using in order to really assess their businesses, figure out where they can improve. And it's been shown over and over again that companies with good, sound environmental ESG policies that are being implemented and tracked by the board le at the board level are more successful than those that don't have them. So as part of those ESG policies uh, for a company, one of those has to be keeping track of uh, these regulations and keeping track of energy use and emissions and so on, everything that comes along with that to make sure that you can comply with those requirements. And that will also help you make sure that you're achieving your ESG goals as well. So a lot to absorb here. Um, I think we've touched on quite a bit in our webinar and on this podcast, but we've really only scratched the surface of this stuff. And we've really only scratched the surface of the energy transition that is coming around the world, both in the EU and Asia and the United States, Canada, 
all major governments are looking at this and figuring out how we're going to transition to a, a carbon neutral economy. And we have a lot more on this in our energy transition webinar series, which can be found on the events page on the Reed Smith website, www.reedsmith.com. If you go there, you can see uh, our energy transition report that was issued in May, a large report filled with articles on how the energy transition is going to be affecting businesses around the world, links to upcoming webinars, and links to some of these podcasts. So. With that, I'll thank you all for joining us and tuning in. And feel free to reach out to Todd or me if we can answer any further questions for you. Thanks, Pete. I echo that and uh, appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak with you all. Energy Explored is a Reed Smith production. Our producer is Ali McCardle. For more information about Reed Smith's energy and natural resources practice, please email energyexplored at reedsmith.com. You can find our podcasts on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and ReadSmith.com. And our social media accounts at ReadSmith LLP on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. This podcast is provided for educational purposes. It does not constitute legal advice and is not intended to establish an attorney-client relationship, nor is it intended to suggest or establish standards of care applicable to particular lawyers in any given situation. Prior results do not guarantee a similar outcome. Any views, opinions, or comments made by any external guest speaker are not to be attributed to Reed Smith LLP or its individual lawyers. All rights reserved.